Chapter 6 Politics and the internal economic problems of Germany always occupied an important place in Enoch's life. But I was very young, and the complicated system of political parties bewildered me. In the new Weimar Republic, there were eight major recognized parties. The NSDAP, Nazi, later made nine. In addition to the parties themselves, there were divisions within a party, such as the Social Democratic Party of Germany, within which there were independent socialists and majority socialists. These two reunited in 1922. The conservative monarchist party of Imperial Germany had become the German National People's Party. The former National Liberal Party became known as the German People's Party. Within this party, there were those who leaned to the left and the right, and those who stood firmly in the centre. All this seemed terribly complicated to me. I listened carefully and hoped that for Enoch's sake, I would someday understand it all. When one is living through world-shaking events, it is sometimes impossible to recognise them. It is only with the passing of time that they assume their correct place in the picture and take on the actual colour of their importance. That was the case in the period following the war and just after our marriage. In the spring of 1921, the Reparations Commission decided that Germany was to pay $32 billion to the Allies. This was a staggering sum because the entire economy within Germany had broken down. The ability to meet the payments would depend largely on the re-establishment of a favourable balance of world trade. Before the end of the war in 1918, the value of the German mark had already declined dangerously. By 1922, the value of the mark was 400 to the dollar. In Germany, there was no working capital and industry was at a standstill which meant that there were millions of people unemployed. Within a year, after the imposition of the reparations terms, it became apparent that Germany under the existing conditions could not live up to them. With the dawn of 1923, which was later to be called the fruitful year, Germany defaulted on her reparations payment of coal and timber. Immediately, French and Belgian troops moved into the rule. Even England protested that this was not justified, but France had been waiting for an excuse to exploit the rich coal mines and the steel and iron industries of the Ruhr district. There was much talk about the passive resistance policy of the people, which also became the policy of the new Kuno cabinet. During this period, there was further wild inflation. The mark plummeted to four million to the dollar, while the country faced bread riots and starvation. Each day was a nightmare, with the people paralysed by fear, uncertainty and the tragedy of financial ruin. Presses working day and night could not print enough marks of high denomination and money was carried in bushel baskets. When this storm of inflation broke with such unbelievable violence, Enoch and I were away on the first holiday we had taken since our marriage. With our two small sons and their nurse, we went to Westerland, at that time one of the most fashionable places on the North Sea. I was delighted when everyone took Enoch and me for a honeymoon couple. The children were kept out of sight by their nurse. We thoroughly enjoyed the sea, the evenings of dancing and the beautiful hotel. After our holiday in Westerland, Enoch wished to go to Hamburg to see the men of his former Navy crew. We were in Hamburg staying at the most expensive hotel when the full force of the inflation struck. Prices in the hotel doubled overnight and within a few days were up to a hundred times normal. Enoch did not have enough money to buy tickets to take us back to Bavaria. We wired for money, but by the time the money reached us the following day, the sizable amount was worthless. There we were, stranded with the two children and the nurse. We could not leave the hotel, 
because we could not pay our staggering hotel bill. We could afford very little food, so we stayed in bed to keep from getting too hungry or weak. In the end, it took a fortune to pay the hotel and get us home. Afterwards, the incident of having to stay in bed seemed very amusing to us, but it was certainly not amusing at the time. Millions of people lost everything they possessed in a matter of days. The German middle class was practically wiped out and it was a fatal blow to a way of life which had withstood even the rigours of the war years. We were among the very few who were not ruined by the catastrophe, though nothing remained but our land and houses. In Gutenberg, we did not suffer for lack of food, but it was a serious problem for Enoch to try to run the estates without any capital. No one escaped the haunting spectre of possible ruin, and the acute anxiety of the times was like a contagious fever. Politically, things grew worse and worse. Enoch accepted an appointment as leader of the Bavarian royalist movement. It was his conviction that the moral strength of a democratic Bavarian kingdom would be a shield for the whole of Germany against the mounting danger of disorder and disintegration. If a Bavarian king could be restored, it would give importance to that part of Germany which had kept alive the real German virtues. Under a democratic monarchy, he felt, the people would be led by men who acknowledged responsibility not only to their king, but to God. A monarchy would also be a shield against the spirit of chauvinism and aggression which was spreading with alarming rapidity in the Reich. Also, it would be a shield against communism. Prince Ruprecht, who would be king, was of the Wittelsbach line, which had ruled in Bavaria for more than seven centuries. The people of Bavaria cherished real affection for the Wittelsbach family. There was a strong bond between them, for Bavarians had looked upon their king as a father. They still clung to the old traditions and customs, which were fundamentally religious, and they felt a definite dislike for the Prussian militarism of the Reich. The worse conditions became, the harder Inak worked to do his part in trying to stem the tide of disaster. There were long, anxious weeks in which I did not even have a letter from him. In August, Chancellor Kuno had resigned in favour of Gustav Streisemann, who was leader of the German People's Party. Chancellor Streisemann formed the Great Coalition Cabinet, which included Democrats, Socialists and Centrists, the Catholic Party, as well as members of his own party. The inflation reached its crest, with the mark dropping to the unbelievable level of four trillion to the dollar. People became hysterical and revolution loomed when in November the Streisemann cabinet finally succeeded in stabilising the German currency. The Renton Bank was established and Renton Marks, a new currency, were put into circulation. This currency was not backed with gold, but by the industrial and agricultural assets of Germany. It was not surprising that in the face of such economic crisis, people gave little thought to an unsuccessful push in Munich on November 9, 1923. In Gutenberg, we heard that such a push had been attempted by an Austrian rabble-rouser named Adolf Hitler. Chancellor Streisemann soon stopped the passive resistance in the Ruhr and reparations deliveries began again. In spite of this, French troops remained in the Ruhr until July of 1925. Although Gustav Streisemann's chancellorship was short-lived, he was appointed foreign minister in the new cabinet. While he held this office, he put all of his heart and strength into solving the reparations problem. He worked tirelessly with the new reparations committee under the chairmanship of Charles D. Dawes. The Dawes plan was adopted at an international conference in London in 1924. This new plan put the reparations on a sounder economic basis. Over a period of 40 years, Germany was to pay $250 million a year. 
This was to be secured by German railroads, industry and bond issues. There was also another $400 million in the form of a secondary annuity. This brought the annual reparations payment to $650 million. With the addition of interest, it meant that Germany must pay 3 billion golden marks annually. Yet, after all his heartbreaking effort to work out the reparation details, Gustav Streisemann was hated and vilified by his own countrymen. He succeeded in having the Dawes plan accepted by the Reichstag, only by the narrowest of margins. The Reichstag elections had been held in May of 1924 and the moderate parties had lost heavily to the communists and nationalists. The reparations problem had scarcely been settled when a new crisis faced Germany. In February of 1925, Reich President Ebert died and a presidential election had to be held. With the country in so unsettled a state, an election was a dangerous thing. For this election, there were seven contending candidates. In the end, old Field Marshal Juan Hindenburg was called from retirement to save the nation. We hoped that the Field Marshal would succeed in spite of his advanced years and that he would gather around him some trustworthy and intelligent men. It is far easier now, with the passing of years, to see how in the midst of the desperate conditions in Germany, National Socialism could have taken root. There was no unified leadership. One cabinet after another failed. The overlapping of parties made for political chaos. These parties were far more interested in their own survival than in the well-being of the nation as a whole. In Enoch's opinion, one of the chief reasons for alarm was the marked spiritual disunity of the people. With the signing of the Locarno Treaty in 1925, hope seemed to flower like a blossom on a dead branch. At last there was promise that old fears and hatreds were to be a thing of the past. In signing the Locarno Treaty, Germany guaranteed the demilitarization of the Rhineland and the new western frontiers. We wondered if the scars of the economic disaster would now begin to heal. Internationally, Germany was in a far better position, but internally there was still serious trouble. National socialism was growing steadily. We began to hear more and more discussion about Adolf Hitler. As early as 1920, the first meetings of the DAP, the German Workers' Party, founded by Anton Dreschler, was held in Munich. The party name was changed in 1921 to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP, and Dreschler was made honorary president of the NSDAP, at that time numbering only a few thousand members. But after Hitler's fiery speeches, the membership soared. So did Hitler's influence, and he soon replaced Dreschler. One of Hitler's first moves was to create the Sturmabteilung, the SA or stormtroopers, who later in 1925 received their brown uniforms, which gave them their name of the brown shirts. They were actually political soldiers, and their first spectacular appearance was in breaking up a social democrat meeting. Without the brown shirts, Hitler could never have risen so quickly to power. The Schottstaffel, the SS Black Guards, were not formed until some time later as bodyguards for Hitler and other party leaders in the NSDAP. In 1923, no one took Hitler seriously, but the stage was already set for the prologue to the tragedy. The next significant development was when Hitler was made leader of the German Kampfbund, which united all nationalistic societies in Bavaria. Within this group, his stormtroopers became a definite force. On the evening of November 8, 1923, a meeting was held in Munich in the famous beer hall, the Bugerbrau Keller. Many leaders of the Bavarian government attended the meeting 
which was by no means a rally of the Nazi party. The speaker of the evening was General State Commissioner Juan Carr, who was to address an audience composed not only of representatives of the Bavarian government, but also leaders of patriotic groups. Hitler determined to use this meeting for his own purposes. Immediately after von Kahr's speech, Hitler interrupted the meeting by firing a shot into the ceiling and followed the spectacular procedure with an inflammatory speech. This startling action was typical of his genius for turning every situation to his own advantage, which was one of the bases of his success. He hoped to win over to his cause many of the influential men in the audience. He did succeed in getting some of them into an adjoining room where he secured their promise to support him in proclaiming a national revolution and dictatorship. It was not until after this private conference that Hitler returned to the main assembly with his proclamation. His strongest ally in this plan was General von Ludendorff, who was the prototype of aggressive militarism, intoxicated with the idea of a mighty Germany in which Germans would again worship the true old Germanic gods. However, the promises exacted from some of the leading Bavarian men were not kept. The following day, November 9th, Hitler organized a propaganda march through the streets of Munich. This march was originally planned to begin at the Bügebrau Keller and end at the town hall, but at the last minute, Hitler decided to extend the march to the building of the army ministry, where he intended to give an ovation to his friend and co-worker, Ernest Rem. When the marchers reached the Fadenhalle on their way to the army ministry, they were met by members of the Bavarian National Police. These police had been ordered to stop the demonstration by the very men who the previous evening had led Hitler to believe that they would support him. The demonstration was quickly dispersed, but the national police were obliged to use their guns and about 14 persons were killed, some of them demonstrators and some innocent bystanders. Later, a memorial commemorating the heroes of the day was erected on one side of the Fadenhalle and all who passed were ordered to pause and give the Nazi salute. Consequently, many people would carefully avoid the street. The Hitler push was a failure. Hitler himself escaped but was soon captured, tried and sent to Landsberg Fortress for five years. It is difficult to explain why he served only eight months of his sentence and it was while he was imprisoned that he wrote part of the now famous Mein Kampf. Everyone thought that we had heard the last of the National Socialists, but unfortunately there was a confusion of purposes. Everyone groped in a different direction for the solution to Germany's problems. Many people could be whipped into a frenzy by the very mention of the Versailles Treaty or reparations. In spite of the fact that foreign capital had given impetus to industry and that agriculture was prospering, there were still millions of unemployed. Hitler was soon promising work to everyone. He shouted against communism, he shouted for religious freedom and a union of all parties to achieve the great aim, a Germanic heaven on earth. After the failure of the Nazi push in 1923, the NSDAP, now called the Nazi Party, was forbidden, but it was again re-established in 1926. In July, a so-called Day of the Party, or Partei Tag, was held in Weimar, and the air reverberated with more Nazi promises. Not long after that, a group of friends were with us in Gutenberg. I remembered it well because a young politician asked Ina, why couldn't you work with Hitler? He has many ideas in accord with your own. Enoch's face grew livid. Never. I know the man. But, our friend reminded him, Hitler will fight communism. Enoch replied vehemently, His fight against communism is a screen. 
I'm convinced that he is brewing a new kind of despotism, more dangerous because of its disguise. How about his attitude towards religious freedom? Our friend asked. Surely you approve of that. Hitler despises all religion, and if he gets to power, mark my words, we will have a fierce anti-Christian war. Enoch was growing very angry and our friend was enjoying baiting him. So you are convinced that Hitler is our most dangerous enemy? I am. He is dangerous because his political ideas are fatally appealing to the German mentality. If he succeeds, it will be because of two types who will follow him. The first, believing blindly in his pack of lies, and secondly, those who will be willing to sacrifice personal integrity for success. Hitler's ideology is Germany's greatest danger, and I intend to fight him. True to his convictions, Enoch's political duties became more demanding. They seemed to absorb every moment of his time, even crowding in on his private life. In 1926, when our daughter, Maria Nivis, was born, Enoch was able to spend only a short period of time at home. Darling, he said contritely, when it was time to leave me and the new child, it sometimes occurs to me that I not only forget myself in my work, but I even forget you. Is it because we are so truly one? That was how close we were our love unchanged by time or separation. In September, Germany was admitted to the League of Nations. In a speech at Geneva, Gustav Streisemann spoke movingly of the souls of nations transcending in importance all material considerations. He hoped that with a mighty stirring of ideas among the nations of the world, Men's energies would now be directed toward the service of humanity. There seemed to be a movement toward a United States of Europe, where all men could at last live in peace and harmony. We hoped so, but soon there were cries against the League of Nations. With the passing of months, the masses began to hear more and more Nazi propaganda, sowing more seeds of dissatisfaction. Hitler was now promising everything to everybody. To the socialist, he promised the realization of his dreams. He promised to protect the churches. To the monarchists, he promised to bring back the king. There was not a group that he did not try to win with his lies. There were many who did not realize that in his promises, Hitler contradicted himself. He claimed that Germany could not exist without her colonies, lost in the war of 1914 to 1918, and he promised to get them back. He promised to build a Germany which would be the greatest nation in the world. At one time, a Christian mentality would have been capable of discerning what was truth and what was lies. But Christianity had ceased to be a part of the life of the majority of Germans. Men who had lost all faith now found a false god in the Nazi ideology. Enoch spent much of his time now in Munich. It was a great temptation for me to move with the children to the Bavarian capital in order to be with him. What restrained me was my understanding of how important it was for Enoch to know that in Gutenberg the fires were lighted and that I waited. Enoch's roots were deep in the soil and I knew that just as a tree needs the rain to refresh it, so Enoch often needed the feel of the soil of Gittenberg beneath his feet. For me, the great house was no longer lonely. Children's laughter filled the rooms. Our boys were very lively, sometimes difficult to cope with. There were wild chases through the rooms, followed by yelping dogs. Freshly polished flowers were used as sliding alleys, much to the disgust of old Wagner, for the spotless floors were his pride and joy. One day he came to me, his face set with determination. Will the Baroness keep those boys, hmm, the young Barons, from doing all this mischief? They are impossible, yes, impossible, so to speak, and if I may so so, I do not understand why the Baroness pays out good money for these contemptible governesses 
if the hmm, young barons are to grow up like gypsies. Yes, like gypsies, that is, so to speak. Shortly after this episode, there was a near revolution in the house. This time the complaint came from Gretchen. For a play which they were giving, the boys had taken some of my best dresses. Then, in all their splendours, king and queen, they had gone to the Hall of Arms, which was their improvised theatre. That day, to complete their theatricals, they needed snow, a real snowstorm. I was called and reached the Hall of Arms before the storm had subsided. This time, I was not amused when I discovered that they had ripped open the fine eiderdown cushions from the state guest room, scattering the feathers all over the floor. Their punishment was to help in gathering up the elusive and nose-tickling snow. While I admired their ingenuity in producing the snowstorm, I was very much upset by the terrible consequences. It was weeks before we could get the last of the eider down out of the furniture and the suits of armour. My music was a great consolation to me during Enoch's absences. For a time I played my violin, but I was too far advanced to be satisfied with mediocrity, and I found myself drawing my musical enjoyment from the many classical recordings which Enoch and I had collected. Even in music, our tastes were identical. We both loved Bach and Mozart. I would sit for hours in the long evenings, filling my soul with the glorious music. It seemed to bridge the loneliness and bring me close to Enoch. I often thought of the first morning in Gutenberg when he had taken me to his study and shown me the statue of St. George and the dragon, the symbol of his high purpose, the goal of his work, the reason for all the lonely hours and separations. I knew how deeply Enoch wished for me to be a true partner in his work. Now I tried my best to take his place wherever his absence made it necessary. I went down into the little town of Gutenberg and visited the sick and the families in need. I tried to find the right words, words which Enoch would have used, his answer to all their many problems. I told them about his work and why the responsibility for so many things now fell to me. Friends visited me and there were long evenings around the fire, vivid discussions about art, about music and religion and, of course, about politics. When Enoch was at home, we often read together out of the ancient books which filled the walls of the library. I began, during his absences, to read English books, at the time not knowing a word of English, though Enoch spoke it fluently. The first language of my childhood, even before I had learned to speak German, had been French. By knowing French and German, I managed to understand the simple English novels. I could guess the thread of the story, and I enjoyed them. After a time, I grew quite proficient with my English reading, and to my own astonishment, when my uncle, Bishop Mikes, brought some English friends to Gutenberg, I found myself taking part in the English conversation. <laughs>